What I want to talk about today is God's will to heal. And kind of since we're going to be talking about that, use this kind of as a, as a um, segue onto to the Wednesday nights. So I'm going to look at quite a few scriptures here. So if you want to open your Bibles, uh, the first one's going to be Acts 10. We're going to spend most of our time in Mark, but I'm going to want you to look at Acts 10 and verse 38. And if you don't want to turn, I can just read it because it's just one verse out of Acts. But it's where Peter is saying he's, he's given his message, and he says in verse 18, How God anointed, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So several things. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, and went about doing good, healing all who were under the power of the devil, whether that was a a physical healing or whether that was a spiritual healing or of deliverance. So if we take that and we use Jesus as our example, then we know that's what we're called to do also. Now, another psalm, you know, Psalm 103 is one of my favorite uh, psalms, and it, and it says, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, and forget none of his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, and healeth all our diseases. So he forgives all our iniquities, and healeth all our diseases. Now, there's three different, I guess, within Christianity today, three different thoughts regarding healing or how it functions. One is that it is in, it is in the atonement. In other words, in by the stripes of Jesus, we are here. We're going to look at some of those scriptures. Another is it's just the Lord. While well, they don't, section of Christianity don't believe it's under the atonement, they do believe that it's God's mercy and grace that he heals people. And then a third group doesn't believe healings for today. Obviously, we're not in that group. So some of you may be in the first group. Some of you may be in the second group. But I want to look at the first one first. So I, we go back to Isaiah chapter 53, before we first have this, and then we have it repeated in the New Testament also. But as I, Isaiah 53 and verses 4 through 6, and I'll read them for you. It says, Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So we have that in Isaiah 53. Then if we uh, go to Matthew chapter 8, we have it repeated a couple different times in the New Testament. I want to read those to see that it carries over. Matthew chapter 8 and verses 16 and 17. It says, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities, and he carried our diseases. So that, again, that scripture of Isaiah is repeated, showing that Jesus fulfilled that. We also have one in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll turn to that. First Peter chapter 2. I'll make that. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin 
and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So we have those two, two different examples in the New Testament of where Isaiah 53 is, is repeated. So as we think of that, we say, well, okay, if, 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 if healing is in atonement, why aren't all Christians healed? Okay, if, if God, or even to take it another step, if it's God's will for Christians to be healed, then why aren't all Christians healed? And I'd have to go to, uh, actually, Second Peter, while we're there, chapter 3, because we have to look at what, what's God's will for salvation. Okay, so if we look at, at uh, First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine. That's not it. Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine. Where's the, Where'd you go? Let me find it because that's I've got it written down wrong. Which is the scripture that says, what God's will for, maybe I got the wrong Peter. But what it says, although I can't see it right now, if somebody finds it, they can shout it out, but that it's God's will that none should perish, but all to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Chapter what? Three of one, First Peter. Oh. Let's say that again. Second Peter three. Nine? Well, that's what I had for it to start with. All right. <clears throat> yes, it is. All right. Never mind. The Lord is not slow to keep his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So does everybody come to repentance? Obviously, no. No one comes to that place. So it would almost be the same as we look at healing. Is, has everyone been healed you pray for? No. But it's God's will for everyone to be healed. Just like it's God's will for everyone to come to that saving knowledge of Jesus. And yet, it, it doesn't, it's not happening because we also have free choice. And there are a lot of other factors going in. So what I just want us to go is let's go to Mark. Gospel of Mark, and we're going to look at several different passages through Mark, and we're going to use uh, Jesus' as an example. So, Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 29 through 34, and it says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went to, with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her. So he went to her and took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait for them. That evening, after the sun set, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So Jesus begins to his healing ministry. He's laying hands on the sick. Sometimes he's just speaking. There's a lot of different ways that, that uh, Jesus used healing, but he healed many. And if we go down to... Uh, to verse 39, same chapter. 
So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Now a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, and this is a be actually for another probably message, but there's three different what are motivations that God healed. And one was compassion. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. So the question was, if you are willing, so the guy didn't have any doubt that Jesus could do it, but are you willing? And Jesus, feeling compassion, says, I am willing. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, as he preached the word to them. Now some men came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And digging through, they lowered the man paralyzed, was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he, saw, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why did this fellow talk like that? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, he took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. But it's interesting, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of these friends of the paralytic who brought him to Jesus. So faith plays a part, but it's not the whole answer. It's not the whole, well, if you had faith enough, you'd be healed. We never want to do that. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. So he, well, let's go back to, to verse 1 of chapter 3. Another time he went to the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Now some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at the stubbornness of their hearts and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. So in this case, he just speaks the word because it, he couldn't really lay hands on the guy because it would be works. So he spoke the work, but he was grieved at the hardness of their heart. Now in verse 25 of the same chapter, let's look at some more examples. Or chapter 5, I'm sorry, let's go to chapter 5 and verse 25. 
In fact, I may want to go back to 22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came to there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Now a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now she has suffered great, a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came and stood behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Instantly, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. Now he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembled with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Now while Jesus was still speaking, some men came to the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring them, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talbothakum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. So a couple different examples there, again, of healing especially with a woman where it involves faith. And it's interesting that when, he, when she touched his clothes, he was instantly healed. And Jesus, turning around, did not know who it was. And she confessed that, that, that she was one and says, it's, it's your faith, it's by your faith. So faith is a critical part, but it's not the whole part. Now, while we're in Mark, this goes through some of the strange ways that Jesus healed. So Mark chapter 7, uh, let's go to verse 31. It says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went to Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis. Now there came some people who brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hands on the man. Now, after he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ear. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh, said to him, Epithereth, which means to be open. At this, the man's ears were open, his tongues were loose, and he began to speak plainly. So in this case, he puts his fingers in his ear, in the guy's ear, he spits. So if you're gonna do that to me, make sure that the Lord is the one telling you to do that, okay? But the point is that the Lord used all sorts of different methods. Um, there's not a formula that we can go around. Now while we're in there, let's look at chapter eight. We got another one there. Chapter eight. Mark, verses 22 through 
through 25. It says that it came to Bethsaida some men who brought a blind man. And begging Jesus to touch him, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Now when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? Now he looked and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. So once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So in this case, Jesus had to pray actually twice. So he spits, touches the guy's eye. He begins to, he can see something. He can see things that he says look like trees. He can, he can see shapes, but he can't really see clearly. And then the Lord lays his hands again on him. And all of a sudden he could see, he can see so sometimes, you know, if Jesus had to pray occasionally twice, I don't think we should give up because we prayed once and we didn't see the answer we wanted. Now, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 27. Just again, just different examples. It says, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd gather around and the teachers of the law arguing with him. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about with him? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech and whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Now I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell into the ground. He rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Now Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father explained, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsing him violently, and it came out. Now the boy looked at so much like a corpse that they, many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and stood up. And Jesus, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Now, one of the other Gospels says, only comes out by prayer and fasting. This one just uses it, comes out by, per, by prayer. So again, it, it takes, you know, the, I always kind of amazed at, at the, uh, when the man said, he says, you know, I, I do believe, but help my unbelief. And I think a lot of times that's where we are. We believe, but there's also unbelief in us. And sometimes that's hard to make that, to make that switch. And it's especially hard when you've prayed for people and you haven't seen them healed. You haven't seen the answer that you, that you wanted to see. 
the Lord help our unbelief. And Mark chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. In fact, let's go back to 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick, on sick people, and they will get well. So these are the signs that are to accompany us. Now, when it talks about picking up snakes, not means that we on purposely go pick up snakes to play with them. But if we are, we are out and we, we can have faith like Paul did when he was uh, shipwrecked and he, gathering wood and a, a viper, said, grabbed on his arm and said that he shook, shook it off in the fire. And all the natives were going, well, this guy must be a murderer because, you know, he, he was saved from the shipwreck, but obviously God is punishing him. He's going to kill him because of this viper. And then when they saw that nothing happened, all of a sudden he became almost like a god to them. Now there's some other verses we can think of, like in James chapter 5, and I want to, I'll read that to you about. Anyone you among you sick, call the elders of the church. James chapter 5. Let's start in verse 13. It says, Is any one of you troubled? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is there anyone of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is, is powerful and effective. So we look at this and we see so many different occasions where it talks about faith, about having faith, having belief. But I want us to look at one to show that's not all the answers. So Acts, turn back to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. So it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Now when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now Peter looked straight at him, and as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw it, they were, that he was walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. 
So in this case, this, this man who's crippled from birth, he had no faith. I mean, he was looking at them to get some silver, some gold, a handout, which is back in those times, they didn't have social security. They didn't have uh, any ways so people would have to beg for their survival. So he was looking for silver and gold. And then Peter says, silver and gold have I not, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Walk, grabs him, he picks it up, and he immediately jumps up. And if you think about this, he was from birth. So that means he would have no, no muscles, no cartilages, no, you know, nothing has been developed at all. He jumps up, and he's able to jump and walk around and praise. And, and so that, it's not only just a healing, but it's actually a creative miracle of recreating things that aren't there. But again, it's not all, it's not, I think sometimes we try to oversimplify healing, and there's a lot of different aspects, there's a lot of different reasons. You know, when we hear, you know, that we must contend for the faith, it also says we must contend for healing. Now, contend means to fight, to war, to strive for, and to battle for. That means it, it doesn't necessarily come easy. It's a, it's a war, it's a, it's a pressing in. It, it takes perseverance. I always go back to, I, th I think, of, of John, John Wimber. Now, he was one who brought healing back in the early 80s, really back into the, into the Christian forefront. And he was one who did not believe that it was in the atonement. He believed when someone got healed, it was it's about God's mercy and about his grace and about his, his compassion for people. And when he first started uh, as pastor, he preached every Sunday on healing. And then he would have a, a healing service afterwards, and people would come forward, and he'd pray for people. And not one person got healed. He did this every Sunday. Got to the place where the uh, eldership board was coming to the place of, you know, we need to make a change. I mean, there's one message is the only thing we're hearing. Nothing's happening. And then one Sunday, somebody came forward and got miraculously healed. And from that moment on, it just began to break loose. But it took patience. It took endurance. It took him, you know, being almost made a fool of. But standing in faith, believing that that was God's will, is to heal. And I think it's the same for us. We need to press in, no matter how many times you think, well, I prayed for somebody and I haven't seen it. We have to continue to pray and watch God and listen to testimonies. You know, we've got a lot of testimonies up here, people who've been healed. We need to hear those testimonies because those testimonies build faith in us. When we hear someone, I remember the first time I prayed for somebody, many years ago, this was probably 1983, I prayed for somebody, and later they came and testified, and they got healed. I got, really? You know, I was almost shocked, you know, but who God used, because I didn't feel anything. I just, you know, I was just praying. Didn't feel anything different than I had before, and it happened. You know, there's many reasons for sickness. Obviously, you know, we have John 10.10, 10, where the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, we're, we live in a fallen world. You know, this is not the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden is coming back, but we're not there yet. There's sin involved in it, sin, individual sin. There's corporate sin that affects people. But one thing we can look at from the Scripture is that Jesus never refused anyone who came to him. Now, there are a lot of people who didn't get healed all those times, but anyone who came to Jesus got healed. And that's what we want to press into because, you know, we have the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no sick people in heaven. And that's, that's what we want to press into. Not that we're going to see the fulfillment of that until Jesus comes back. But that's our goal, to press in for healing. I told you earlier that, you know, there's three main reasons that, that Jesus healed and of course, one was compassion, and I've got a lot of different verses I give you on that, but a lot in Matthew talks about having compassion on those. He felt compassion in Luke. 
and in Mark and in Matthew. Another reason was to glorify the Father and himself. And the third was in response to faith. So as we begin this journey, especially as we begin to think about Wednesday night and begin to enter into a time where we, we focus on healing, we listen to different testimonies of different ones, what others have learned through their studies. You know, that's what we want it to be. You know, it's not going to be a teaching format where somebody's going to give a whole teaching. We're going to give experiences. We're going to give our own thoughts. We're going to have everybody involved. So, so it's more like a home group. It's more like we all have testimonies. We all have experiences and believe that God's going to meet us in that. And again, the third part or the second part of that would be as we pray for people, not only for healing, but we pray for a move of God. That without revival, without a third great awakening coming to this nation, we don't have any hope. I mean, we are circling the drain. But through God can do anything. And even if we keep circling the drain and we can't stop it, revival is bringing king people into the kingdom of God. And it's still manifesting. So, you know, when the darkness gets darker, the light shines lighter. And so we may be seeing that, that clash, you know, clash of kingdoms. And not only the clash of kingdoms, but, you know, Jesus said that, that Satan's been thrown to the earth, and his, he knows his time is short, so things are going to get ugly. But, but as Michael said, we trust in the Lord. You know, our faith is in him no, no matter what happens, no matter what things get bad, no matter how things don't go according to our plans or what we'd like to see, we have our faith in the Lord. I, uh, I'm going to be doing a message soon. I just felt, it's interesting, I really felt the Lord was, was wanting me to do a message on the resurrection. I'm not, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the resurrection of Jesus. I'm talking about our resurrection. And Nathan had sent me a, um, a teaching it wasn't a teaching, it was a link to a sermon that, uh, uh, from the 1860, Spurgeon had done, and it just kind of confirmed a lot of the same things that I'd been thinking about. And it was interesting, because in that message, he says, and this was back in the 1860s, he says, no one talks about the resurrection. And then I got thinking about all the years been here, I've never heard a message about our resurrection. And, how, and yet that is a fundamental, it's our hope, it's our future. And yet, we don't, you know, we don't preach about it, we don't talk about it. It's, it's such a huge thing in our future that, which if we focus on that, then no matter what's happening here on earth in these, you know, these 70, 80, 90 years that you're alive here, what is that? I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing. We have an awesome future and glory. So anyway, that's going to be coming. That's probably be the next, next one I do. So anyway, just pray for revelation and understanding. So all right. So anyway, healing, I want to again encourage you guys to stay faithful, to press in. No matter how many times you might have prayed for somebody and you haven't seen it happen, press in and continue to pray. Continue to lay hands on the sick. Continue to stand in your own, for your own faith in your own healing. And I believe God is going to break in with power and might. And we're going to see some mighty things happening in our day and our time. And again, it may get dark, but the light's going to shine that much brighter. So let's go ahead and stand. Anyone who would like uh, prayer, whether it's healing or prayer for whatever uh, you need, feel free to come up, and we'll be glad to gather around and pray for you. And just again, I want to encourage you guys for Wednesday night to, to make an effort to be here so that we can all get together, we can discuss, we can talk about it, we can build our own faith within one another. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, that your will is healing. Lord, we do pray that Lord's prayer, that Lord, thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want to displace the darkness and bring your light. Lord, we forget none of your benefits, who healeth all, who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Because it is by the stripes of Jesus that we are healed. And Lord, we ask for revelation as a, as a church family. Lord, are there missing pieces that we're missing? Is there something that we're not tapping into? Lord, would you give us insight? Would you give us revelation? Would you give us, again, understanding? Lord, we as a people want to be able to minister to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't only want to see healings. We want to see miracles and creative miracles, Lord. Lord, we want to see Anna come out of that wheelchair, Lord. Lord, nothing is too hard for you. So, Lord, we want to stand and believe and press into you. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.